Welcome back to another session on Innovation Alley at EduTech 2020, a fully virtual EdTech conference. Started at the university where I was teaching, I was teaching first year accounting and essentially looking for a way to improve the performance and success rate for students. How could we make it so that every student could be a mentor, every student could tutor somebody else? What's the technology piece missing there to make that work at scale? Realistically, AI is, is such a powerful um, you know, tool or, or mechanism that can be deployed to solve so many different problems. I wouldn't wish raising capital on capital on my worst enemy. Um, it's tough. It's it's no 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 no. We love your idea, but not yet. Come back in twelve months. There's been a huge um, huge acceleration in the investment in um, edge tech at a global level. There is still a role for government. There is a role for large education providers. There is a role for large education systems to play in that ideation space and the innovation space. My name is Ben Hallett. I'm one of the three co-founders of Vigo and I also take on the CEO role. Uh, at Vigo, we are a student support platform for higher education providers. We help institutions scale their student support uh, and take that online and digital and to put it out to all of their students. Um, typically that looks like tutoring, uh, mentoring and staff advisory. So key challenges for Vigo to get to the point that we uh, now are at would be firstly, finding that first university partner to work with. We had to do a lot to showcase the product and really make them trust in us. But we found once we had that partner in place, the rest of the market starting, started to really open up for us uh, quite quickly. The second key challenge would be uh, showcasing to Australian investors the opportunity in education and really showcasing the opportunity uh, globally there as well. So thinking back to those early days uh, when we were inspired to start Vigo, it really came out of um, our actual experience inside of our institution um, at that time. So, we, we had been tutors and mentors uh, for years uh, and we had been also mentees and tutees for years and we'd already really understood the value uh, inside of that but it was our institution's refugee mentoring program where we were mentoring refugee students that really just changed the game for us. Uh, we, at that point, we really came out with a conviction of the the absolute power in uh, student support uh, for not only for the mentee but also the mentor and we came out with the conviction that everybody deserves a champion and everybody deserves the opportunity to become a champion for somebody else. Uh, generally as a startup it can be a bit interesting uh, coming from Australia and then, and then going uh, overseas and the perceptions that people might have about you. The, um, one of the first uh, experiences I had in Silicon Valley was uh, someone said, oh, you're from Australia. Oh, you have um, you know, eight customers, that's cute. <laughs> you know? um, so there's, there can be misunderstandings about the market and, um, and then the, the Australian ability to translate our products into overseas and to win those markets. When we landed in the UK, we found that our Australian strategy translated perfectly uh, to that market and that is to find one lighthouse partner over there willing to work with us, create a good story with them, to then open up doors with other partners in the market. For Vigo, in choosing our next markets, we really had to think about, well, where are our team strengths? And when I say team, I mean our co-founding team, I mean our staff, and also our investors. And when we looked at that, we really saw that we had strengths in the UK and the US, and that we could expand to those markets quicker than others because of our team. We created Vigo to solve an opportunity that we saw here in the Australian market. And when we went out for investment, it was quite clear that we were going to have to start focusing on global markets quickly uh, to meet investor expectations, So, which is what we've done. Which is why we've now launched our first UK partner quite early on in the journey of Vigo. So Vigo has been operating now for three years and it's been quite interesting how uh, everything has changed over that time. You know, not only how we measure success, but how we think about the business, um, how the product has evolved as well, and how we've changed the product to meet the market. The, you know, in the early stages, it was all about discovery and everything was a completely vertical learning curve all the time. Um, and it was just the co-founders, so it was just the three of us. So we were everything. We were the marketing, we were, um, we were the customer success, we were the sales team, we were the tech. Um, and now, 
the, as you get later and later stage, you start to fill out roles, uh, get staff to, to take on those roles, people who are better than you at those things and bringing them on. And suddenly as a founder, your challenges in your day to day becomes much more about enabling other people to interact with your vision. So welcome to the next session that we've got at Innovation Alley at EduTech 2020, which is a fully virtual conference. And we've got the pleasure of speaking to a whole range of fantastic edtech entrepreneurs. My name's David Linky. I'm the Managing Director of EduGrowth, and we are Australia's education technology and innovation industry hub. Today, we're going to have a really interesting conversation. We're going to chat with Ben um, Hallett, who really observed the personal problem as a uni student. He then thought about it and um, after graduation went into his working life and then the realization dawned that his experience was being felt by others and that led to the founding of Vigo and a platform that supports students locally and internationally. Ben, welcome. Thanks very much for being with us. Hi David, thanks for having me. Very good to be here. Why don't we start by, why don't you give us a little bit of an intro to yourself, a little bit about Vigo, what problems you're working on and then we'll jump into some other things. Yeah, sure. Uh, so my name is Ben Hallett. I am the CEO and co-founder of Vigo. There's I'm one of three co-founders, along with Joel Dijapani and Stephen Hasty. My role in the company is really in the partner engagement side. So that is our investors, that is our, our universities, our government partners, and really uh, telling the story and putting that out there. But for those who about Vigo, Vigo is a student support platform. And what we do is we help educators, uh, universities or governments, we help them put all of the different support services that they have on offer, be it tutors, mentors, counselors, advisors, all of these different people. We put them in the fingertips of their students on their phones, on their laptops, so that students can interact with the support services they need when and where and how they need to interact with them, which is quite relevant in COVID when everybody needed to suddenly interact with these services online. And we, uh, we, we got started for uh, two core convictions that we came to hold while we were studying at university ourselves. And that really stuck with us when we got out into industry and stuck with us so much that we decided to come back and address these convictions. The conviction what, number what, one. What was that yeah? problem, Ben? What was, the deep, what was the depth of that problem that you observed that you wanted to fix? Yeah, so the, the I mean, the first one, uh, it was really two problems we were solving. The first one was that we could see students falling through support cracks at the university that we were at. And, and it wasn't for the lack of trying of the university. They had these services available, but these services simply uh, for a number of different reasons, and one of them was a lacking of technology, couldn't be at students when they needed them. And we had a very particular story that was close to our hearts, a really good friend of ours who, who you know, at, a, at a one time of his university degree, like many students, he needed probably simultaneously a counselor, a tutor, advisor, and a mentor from the institution. But all those services were locked on campus and weren't available to him in the moment that he needed it. And that led us to that first conviction I talked about, which was that every student deserves a champion. And so we decided to make it so that we could get all these services and put them at the fingertips of students so that, that students wouldn't fall through those cracks. Okay. And the, um, yeah, the second part of that story, David, just real quick, was the yeah. um, when we got to the end of our university degree, we had the pleasure of being involved in one of the university's mentoring programs, a uh, refugee mentoring program. And we were the mentors in this case. And that program changed our, our lives as mentors. It gave us so much um, employability skills, confidence, a sense of community, a sense of connection, and all these skills we took into the workforce. And we came out with that second conviction of, well, how could we make it so that every student could be a mentor, every student could tutor somebody else? What's the technology piece missing there to make that work at scale? And hence, Vigo was born. Fantastic. And, and th there's a really interesting part of this story because you, you and I obviously know each other. So I'm really interested in, essentially, you, you, you graduate, you have these experiences, you get out in the real world, and you start a first career, right? Like, you ended up becoming a professional musician, right? <laughs> and you did that for a long time. You stopped that. And lots of people would say that it's really successful and wanted to continue to do that. But you stopped that and decided to build Vigo and start an edtech company. I'm interested in that. Well, how does that happen? Yeah, well, I mean, the I, I had sort of two careers that I was working with before I decided to start Vigo with my co-founders. Uh, and that was, you know, one, I, I had a, a music gig that was going um, relatively well. 
And I also, um, from studying as, at the university, I was an engineer out in the workforce and I was a professional engineer. And, and I landed a job at one of the best um, uh, engineering companies in Australia. And I think that is one most innovative company in Australia, I think just in AFI last week. And the, the musician gig was like, that one was, you know, that was, it's always been a hobby for us and a passion. And we, you know, we weren't really willing to sacrifice too much to make that our professional um, work too much. But the engineering gig was something that I'd worked quite hard for. And it seemed a bit silly for me to then drop that and become a, a co-founder. Um, the, ultimately, we decided to, to go on this journey and become a founder because we, we were finding that we, we had so much additional energy uh, outside of our day-to-day -day work needed to channel something in uh, you know we and that job that we had at the time it really wasn't feeding our needs for you know risk and creativity and making big moves and leadership uh, at that time so we decided to create those opportunities for ourselves in our home time and and when we decided well what, what are we going to put this energy towards we thought about well what are we passionate about and that's what led us back to those convictions that we came to hell um, when, and when we investigated it investigated it we um we basically found that there was something in this that we could actually work on. And so for nights and weekends for at least two years, we were working on what Vigo could be. And it wasn't called Vigo then, it was called uqengtutor.com. And, you know, so we were able to use our day job to really sustain us like ourselves and pay the bills while we were working on our, um, on our startup. And eventually that startup became, you know, half of our work life and it became 75%. And then eventually we handed in our resignation letters and we're more 100% on the business. And what, what was the time frame that this took? How long did it take from this idea? I'm going to work on my side hustle using the language that people would use today. And now I'm yeah. going to turn it into my full-time gig. Yeah. So from the, the first, the, the first sort of time period was from idea and through and conviction that we we're going to solve that idea um, through to the time we first put something in students' hands. Uh, to use, and that time period was one year, uh, which in hindsight seems incredibly slow. We really, you know, in everything we learned as about being an entrepreneur, we probably could have put something in students' hands within one month and not within a year, but that was our time scale. And then the, the sort of second time scale would be from the time we first put something in students' hands to the moment where we first sold a contract to an education institution, which was um, a really big pivot in the business. And that that took uh, a year and a half. That one, eighteen months. So th that's a really good point too to think about about pivot for a minute. So obviously, some things changed in your professional life. What you think you were going to do? You started to be an engineer. You become a musician. Now you're becoming an edtech founder. So there are obviously have been some pivots in the Vigo journey. Let's talk very briefly about how the product changed over that period of time. What's the business model changed over the, that time? Yeah, so at the very beginning, we, we knew we had a passion for and these convictions about students and we needed a way to get that out um, into the, we need to go out and help students as quickly as we could to actually test these things out. The, the quickest way to do that was not working with institutions. We had an idea that maybe somewhere down in our, um, you know, really far down in our sort of roadmap, we could eventually start you know, working and selling to universities. But for the moment, the quickest way for us to go out and solve the, the thing that we cared about was without, you know, having to worry about big enterprise contracts and enterprise software and any of that stuff. And it was actually just getting an app out to put on students' phones. And so the very first iteration of, of Vigo was direct to student. And it was a model where we would charge students to use the service, you know, 20% on every tutoring session they had. And because of that, without those restrictions of having to be an enterprise platform with insurances and all, you know, all sorts of other things, we were able to get something out quickly. And when we got that out to students, we were able to learn a whole lot about the idea that we had. And some of the key things we learned were that, hey, students actually really want this. We had you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of students signing up and using it in all sorts of interesting ways. And we learned about well, what do students actually want to use it for? And then we also learned that, okay, the financial uh, side of this probably isn't going to be able to sustain us as a job full time uh, in this student model. You know, to, to make money from students, we're going to have to either charge them a lot of money, which they don't have, or we're going to get need to get to a million, two million students 
very, very quickly, and um, which was also wasn't possible. So that sort of need of, okay, we're running out of uh, money and we want to go more full time on this, where are we going to go? That really led us to, I guess, follow the money in the problem. And the money in the problem was also um, being experienced on the university side. And so that led us then to the path of um, interviewing you know, vice chancellors, um, you know, speaking with student unions and things like that, and really understanding, you know, what were their, what's their side of these problems. And we discovered, well, when, when a student doesn't get the support they need, they drop out. And when a student drops out, that's really bad for universities. And it's, you know, financially bad and it's against their mission. So, you know, these institutions, they, you know, relatively have a fair bit of financial resources to work with. They can actually fund this work. They can fund our mission. So that really led us down the B2B path where we are now exclusively where we sell to universities and they put the platform out to their students for free. Okay. Yeah. So that, that sort of leads really to this idea of, you know, finding your first customers in this journey, because I have a contention that, you know, finding your first education customer is challenging, right? It's to finding any first customer in any startup is a challenging thing, but education is a particularly unique environment. And you want to sort of give us a bit of an insight of how you found your first customer and, you know, you know what that looked like. We don't want to look about numbers and stuff. We want to look about the model. Yeah. So the we were selling to students, and we'll we're actually we're putting up posters around. Um, we're putting up posters around one university, and you know that said, you know, uh, peer tutoring platform. You know, here's how you get it. And then we, I realized I was putting up the poster right next to another poster that said, you know, peer tutoring um, program. And that program was actually owned by that university's student union. And, and that really got us thinking, well, like, who is the student union? And do they have money? And could they actually move maybe a little bit quicker than, say, some of the other parts of the institution? And I think that's, that was a really interesting lesson about universities, particularly Australian universities, is you, you tend to think of them as one company and one selling point, but they're really not. They're, they're essentially, you know, a, a large institution might, they, they act like maybe 20 different companies. You know, there's a student union, there's an indigenous unit, there's different faculties and, and all these different faculties and different, you know, sub companies, they're able to move at different speeds. They have different budgets. They have different um, appetites for innovation or for risk. And so at Vigo, we, the very first people we actually were able to work with were the student unions. And the student unions were quite interesting because they have this pocket of funding called um, the student services amenities fee, which at a, at a typical institution, we're talking, you know, like three, four, five million dollars per year that these guys get to control and they have to use it for the good of the students. And so when we came around and we were able to say like, you know, hey, we've got this really innovative um, marketplace that allows students to help each other. Uh, we'd love to do it in partnership with you. They were able to move quite quickly. And within weeks, we had actually then signed our very first B2B contract and so for that next you know nine months we we worked only with student unions and that was a really um really good gateway into the university space and we we're able to start proving um what we could do in a b2b space proving our value proving our trust and getting to pseudo work with the university's you know logo and from there that position that's when we could do the final dive in and start working with the actual core parts of the universities and start selling the really big contracts to the vice chancellors, the deputy vice chancellors. If we turn it back to student support for a minute, we, we've talked about this idea of providing support directly to students themselves, then working through their sort of um, organising network being the student union, and now working with ultimately the university. What's mm. the journey been in the way you, you've sort of, you're learning about the sort of different customer model or needs across those three entities and what that might look like now? Yeah, I, I'm really grateful for the um, the route that we took to working with universities. I think, I think a lot of ed tech has been built first for administrators and then shoehorned for students. Whereas Vigo, um, because of the journey we took, we had we were built for students, and we thought this is the way we're gonna, you know, be able to fund and eat. Um, so we need to make this space awesome for students, so that they actually pay us. 
Um, and then it was only later on that we actually then, for lack of a better word, shoehorned it for universities and rebuilt the platform for them. So the I think one of the, the magic things about Vigo, and it was you know, by accident really um, of our mission, was that we, we focused first on the universities and customer before we started focusing on their administration um, uh, side of things. And in, in doing so, we actually created something quite innovative and something that was a little bit contrarian for its time um, in, in the way that how much it trusted students to give support to each other. And that then uh, eventually the market caught up a little bit and that then really uh, put us in a unique position. We had a new, unique mission and vision that we now get to share with universities. The, the lesson for when we were you know, transitioning to those enterprise contracts was, was you know, we learned that we, we yes, universities, they, um, they students as their number one priority, but they also, um, they're regulated and they have other boxes that they just need to tick. You know, everything from security to safety to insurances to, you know, other sorts of policies and things like that, um, partner success management, integrations, all that sort of things. So we had to learn, we had to learn what were these other boxes that universities just had to tick in, in order to allow us to, to, you know, focus on the thing that we care about, the students. And um, so that was a big learning, learning what was required. And then also learning what was required, um, you know, at the very minimum to get started with a pilot versus what was actually going to be required for us to then to go full enterprise rollout at their institution. And I think that's, uh, that's a really important thing um, for everybody to remember if you're starting an ed tech company is uh, often there's a place that you can land within an institution that it won't have the same red, red tape as the, um, as the, you know, the really central part. They can move a little bit quicker. You know, you can get started with them maybe in a light use case while you tick off some of the other boxes that the institution is going to need to see from you um, for a full scale rollout. And uh, that sort of seed, seed and grow relationship at a university, yeah, that's really paid off for Vigo. And we have universities now growing to really big extents with us who only started with just one program in one sort of tucked away part of the institution. Fantastic, because that, that I think is sort of an essence of all good relationships, to be honest. You, you've got to start small and you've got to grow them as they, as they develop over time. Mm. Um, which leads me now to this sort of idea of how do you balance the need of the student with the need of the institution? Mm. and if they if are they aligned yeah i mean they they are aligned uh you know at the end of the day you look at any university's strategy and they're all you know their five-year strategies are all online so you know for anyone who's starting a business go and look them up and memorize them and then go back to the deputy vice chancellor with the strategy and say where you can help um you know those strategies they they are very student focused sometimes i, I will admit that um staff can lose sight of their, their student passion, their student focus. And so in that times, you know, we do a lot to try and motivate people to get back to their roots, back to the focusing on the student, refresh that sort of passion that they, they've definitely had at some point over their career. And uh, one of the key ways we've done that recently was we announced a really big goal um, as a result of COVID to champion 1 million students. And we've used, we've really got around this word champion and this big target and that target has been a really, a really great conversation for us to have with everybody from the vice chancellor down to the program manager level and really helps frame the conversation always back on how are we championing students and how can we do more? How can we give, give more? You know, so that's, I guess the lesson out of there is, you know, education is a really special place because everybody who is here is, you know, pretty much here because they care about changing people's lives and it does have um it does have that that sort of second part to it that that deeper part of it that you know education is transformation and in, in ed tech we change people's lives and we get to do that every day so when you know most people are aligned with that and if they're if they're not aligned in the moment there's some things that you can do to, to get everybody back on the same page back focused on the student in the first place so yeah, that, that would be our biggest uh, learning. You know, that being said, we've invested heavily in partner success, uh, partner success team. You know, so we have a whole team that once someone buys the software, this team then goes and basically works for the partner and makes it helps them uh, with all the change management that's going on inside the institution that 
that holds their hand through that process, that helps them um, ideate through that process, helps them innovate. We have a whole suite of resources and materials that makes that make that process easy. And I guess that's probably another learning is, you know, you as the ed tech provider, you know, David, you actually said to me once, you know, if you think you're in the business of ed tech, you're wrong. You're in the business of change management. And um, you, we as the ed tech providers, we can't just create the software and go, here you go, here's a USB stick with the software, good luck. You actually need to help them implement it um, and help them make it a success. And so, you know, whether that's a people, whether that's resources, whether it's a combination of both, um, yeah, you need to do it all at the beginning. Well, there's, there should be two learnings there, firstly, for you. Firstly, if you're delivering software on a USB stick, you're in the wrong business. It's 2020. <laughs> Let's do it on a SaaS platform. And secondly, anything that I say, you should take with a big grain of salt. Um, <laughs> No. It's a sort of, I want to, it's a nice way to segue to really where I want to conclude our conversation. And I want to talk about your personal entrepreneur journey, really. And I want to talk really about two things. If you could go back in time, the two years, three years, four years, whenever it was when you woke up and decided that you're going to do this, what would you tell that younger Ben? And she really seems really strange saying that to you because I know you're all about like 22 or something now. But anyway, go back. If you go back and talk to that 16-year-old Ben, what are you saying to him? What, what um, are you wishing you then that you know now? Well, I'm much older than I look, David, um, okay. but I'll take that. <laughs> um, so I was thinking about this. Uh, what do I wish I, I knew? I mean, like, obviously, I'd love if I had all this market knowledge and things like that delivered to me nicely, you know, back at the beginning. But to be honest, I don't think I would have taken it seriously at that time. So I don't, I don't think it's market knowledge. I think what I wish I had known at the beginning was two things. Number one, the power of storytelling. You know, I, I had heard this in my engineering job and I did not take it seriously at all. Um, that with a story, you could, you know, you could change anything. You could sell a human, you could, you could sell a vision, you could sell an investor. And so I only really learned that maybe two years in. And when Vigo really got its story together, um, that's when everything started to click. The investors started, um, you know, it clicked in their brains. They started putting in money. Universities started, um, you know, trusting us and giving us contracts. And so I would go back and tell myself, go invest in, in whatever sort of training you need to do to become a really good storyteller because you'll be able to shave, you know, a year off your, you know, how long it takes you to raise investment and probably a year off how long it takes you to sell your first university um, client. And the second thing I wish I had known was the value of people uh, and investing in really good people. Maybe at the beginning, we, we focused a little bit more on hiring people who, um, who were, you know, we could afford and were more, uh, were maybe entrepreneurial like us um, a little bit. And instead of really hiring, hiring people who had expertise in the education field and networks in the education field, in hindsight, I would tell myself to, you know, go spend the extra bit of money and bring in those people, you know, tell them a good story, bring them in uh, at, at, at the beginning. And if you don't have enough money, go, you know, to hire them, go tell an investor, the person that you want to hire and why that's going to be amazing and what that's going to do to your business. So those are the two things, storytelling and hiring um, in amazing expertise. I agree very much with the narrative statement, right? The, the successful, any successful thing has a story behind it. Whether the story's real or not, is that's the next piece, that's the execution piece. But if you can't describe the story of what you're doing, it's very, very difficult to get other people to buy into that, right? Data mm -hmm. on its own is nowhere near as um, compelling as the story of the student that you started with, with, with your friend who, um, mm. didn't do so well, right? You know, that's yeah. the story that people need to hear. Let's finish with a with a, a question because you, you raised it and you talked about it. Let's talk a little bit just very briefly about capital raising. So I'm interested in your personal journey in that process. How did you find the investors that you ended up choosing mm. and how did you know they were the right fit for you? Yeah, so the how we really began that process, I mean, we tried to raise money way too early at the very beginning before we had no idea what we're doing or how to do it. And all the investors we spoke to said, you have no idea what you're doing. Go out and have a go at this kind of stuff and then come back with, to us with some learnings. <laughs> so we, we, we originally tried to raise at the very beginning, didn't work. We, we came back then with traction uh, years later. 
And we, the very first people who, who put in money was actually UQ. And it, was, it wasn't, they didn't take an equity stake in the company. It was through UQ's accelerator program, iLab, where they effectively give you um, a grant for your business. And it's a, it's a competitive process. So that was our first capital injection in the business. And that was really awesome. And I, and I encourage everybody to, to look into what institutions and where the different accelerators are available to them. Um, and I encourage universities to keep owning the accelerator space. Please don't um, give up on that space. They, everybody needs you to do that. The, with our first um, formal investor, our equity investor, after doing the accelerator, it actually um, came, and this is a great plug, came from an EduGrowth event. Oh, okay. So um, I, met, um, I met this person at an EduGrowth event. He was on a panel and that I was, um, I was pitching to. And then later on, I emailed him and I said, um, I'd like you to mentor me and I'd like to catch up every so often and keep a check on the business. And that's what we did for a full year. Um, he he kept a tab on the business and and he actually wasn't really quite ready to invest for, for a while. I, I kind of pushed that a little bit with him um, and he wasn't ready to invest. He didn't quite get it, he, but he had a bunch of suggestions and he kept meeting with us. And it was, it was like what I said, it was this one moment where um, he was in the crowd at an at a big uh, event that I was pitching at, and I had really worked on the story and changing the story um, of Vigo, and you know, still all true and still the guts of it, but really just reworking the way that we presented it. And I went and I pitched that and at, at the event, and he um, he as soon as I got off stage, he he said, "Come come here." He like waved at me, and I, I went out the back with him, and he he asked me like you know three or four like really quick fast questions, you know. What salary are you going to pay yourself? What, how much money will you make in June next year? And blah blah blah. And then at the end of it, he, he looked, you know, he nodded his head and he's like, "All right, I'm in." And he shook my hand and he said, "Send me your bank account details. I'll throw the money in tomorrow. We'll sort out the legals later." Oh, cool. And uh, yeah, and, and so I knew he was the right investor because he had taken the time to invest in us with his time, which is, you know, for a wealthy individual, is their most valuable resource is their time, right? And um, I, so I trusted him and I trusted that he was making a, um, an informed and smart decision about us. And and that has really paid off because he has been our best investor since. And what, what was interesting about that investment process was, you know, he committed, he, he only committed to, a, a you know, maybe 25% of our round at the time. And, but as soon as we had his name in, it became, in round, it became so much easier then to go and get other people, all these people we had met previously and said, hey, you know, he's in, are you in? And they're like, oh, I'm in. And then we say, these two guys are in, are you in? And we say, okay, these five people are in, but you need to double your stake if you're gonna be involved. And like, all right, I'm in double. And so it's that momentum breeds momentum once you have that first name or logo behind you. Uh, agreed, that's a great story. So. Um, there, there's no doubt that brand recognition, you've talked about it twice now, right? Brand recognition with the university, brand recognition with the student, and now actually third time you talked about a brand recognition with um, an investor. So this yeah. now sort of concludes our, our, our chat, and I wanted to give you the opportunity. In 2020, we have Choose Your Own Education Pathway, so now I'm bringing the democracy to the EduTech Innovation Alley, allowing mm -hmm. you to choose each question you end with. So I've got two options for you. You can choose. We're entering a period where education institutions need to retain students even more than they ever have before. Um, will they be doing that internally or via path partners? So that's the first question. Or option two, you could go with when you've been considering your international expansion, do you think the Australian brand helped and the logos of the institutions that you're working with, does it help? Ah, mate, I'd love to answer both of those. Uh, I'll I'll go with the first question, and and I uh, in, so you know next year, like how are we going to be addressing some of these problems? Is it or challenges or opportunities? Is it universities doing it in house, or is it doing or is it them outsourcing it? I um, I believe it's it's a mixture of both, and I um, I think you know, when it comes to student retention, I'm very biased, but I think one of the key things we need to do is to unlock the students' community to be able to support itself online at scale. And so I think universities will be looking more and more and more to outsource the software component to allow their in-house services to scale better. Um, so that could be a support management system. It could be really good um, learning management systems. It could be uh, all sorts of other student engagement tools. I think 
the idea of universities um, building things themselves over, you know, spending millions of dollars to create an app that will take them years and years and years to, to you know, iterate. I think that is becoming less attractive to institutions and they're just looking for solutions now. So they need people who have already gone out and built that, who have iterated quickly, who can move really quickly in the future and listen to them to adapt to their uh, changing needs. Fantastic. Ben, thank, thank you so much for your time today to give us a bit of an insight to the Vigo story, where you started, where you've gone and some of the learnings you've had along the way. And um, I look forward to uh, having you back on our Innovation Alley stage in a few years' time and getting the update. Thanks very much, Ben. Thanks, David. Cheers, guys. Welcome back to another session on Innovation Alley at EduTech 2020, a fully virtual EdTech conference. Started at the university where I was teaching, I was teaching first year accounting and essentially looking for a way to improve the performance and success rate for students. How could we make it so that every student could be a mentor, every student could tutor somebody else? What's the technology piece missing there to make that work at scale? Realistically, AI is, is such a powerful um, you know, tool or, or mechanism that can be deployed to solve so many different problems. I wouldn't wish raising capital on capital on my worst enemy. Um, it's tough. It's it's no 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 no. We love your idea, but not yet. Come back in twelve months. There's been a huge um, huge acceleration in the investment in um, edge tech at a global level. There is still a role for government. There is a role for large education providers. There is a role for large education systems to play in that ideation space and the innovation space.